Hey, it's Seth. And Molly. And do we have news for you. Big Picture Science is now on Patreon. Patreon makes it easy for you to donate any amount to the radio show. So join us now, please, at patreon.com slash bigpicturescience. And this is news for you because after choosing a monthly giving level, you can sit back, open a cold one, and reap the rewards. Because not only do you keep the radio show going, which is reward in itself, but each giving level comes with an extra perk. For example, you might get bonus content, the opportunity to participate in polls that will help guide future episodes, hearing your name read aloud during the credits, or even meet Seth virtually, that is. <laughs> I'm not sure you would want that, but here's the thing. Patreon makes supporting content you like, such as this radio show slash podcast, easy. For $5 a month, for example, you'll get exclusive content. And it's easy to sign up at patreon.com slash bigpicturescience. I know because I just did it. And I can tell you the hardest bit of it was proving that you're not a robot. (laughs) I'm glad to hear that, Molly. Honestly, we appreciate your support. Because we couldn't do the show without you. Just mosey on over to patreon.com slash bigpicturescience. Thank you. Thank you. First comes love, then comes marriage, then comes so-and-so with a baby carriage. I know, if only it were that simple. There are many reasons why that romantic view of starting a family is not always realistic. It's not simply because no one has mentioned the stress of a second mortgage or writing college tuition checks. Love and marriage may not follow in that order or be present at all for there to be babies. Changes in advanced biotechnology may be about to burst that bubble for good. It may be that in the future, sex won't be involved in making babies. Oh, humans will still have babies, just not the old-fashioned way. I'm Molly Bentley. I'm Seth Shostak. Welcome to Big Picture Science, produced at the SETI Institute, where researchers investigate the nature and origin of life. On Big Picture Science, we step back to get the wide-angle view on science and technology. And in this episode, birds, bees, and of course humans have been doing it for a long time, and for good reason. Sexual reproduction is not just fun, it's an efficient way to mix genes and ensure survival. But some species reproduce asexually, and biotechnology may eliminate the need to have sex in order to create our successors. But if we get rid of sex, what happens next? It's sex post facto. There are a lot of reasons that animals have sex, although I can't say that I've talked to many of them about that, but taking a strictly evolutionary point of view, it's all about survival. Having sex ensures that your innate talent for ambidextrous bocce ball is passed on, and even better, that the human species continues to exist. In cases where a species is tested by a novel environment, changes to its DNA brought about by genetic shuffling may give it important adaptive advantages. We think of evolution occurring over long spans of time, thousands if not millions of years, but it can also happen relatively quickly. Indeed, it can unfold right under our noses. A number of studies are showing that animals moved into cities are adapting to the unique stresses of the urban environment at the genetic level. Their behavior, in some cases their morphology, are changing and on timescales we can witness. In an op-ed in the New York Times, evolutionary biologist Menno Skilthausen gives examples of how sex in the city is changing the course of evolution for some species. In cities or other areas that are very strongly influenced by humans, the conditions of these ecosystems are drastically altered, and that creates a survive-or-die situation for many animals and plants. And that means that uh, this natural selection that, that causes evolution to take place is a very strong force, and it can make animals and plants change in a matter of years or decades. Well, well what kind of uh, animals are making these uh, changes? I mean, when I think of the wildlife in cities, I think of pigeons and, and other birds that I can't recognize. I mean, there aren't too many, I don't know, mountain lions in the cities. What, what, what sort of animals are moving in? Uh, lots of animals are moving in, indeed birds, and uh, but also large carnivores, coyotes in Chicago are, are now a familiar sight. Uh, here in Europe, we have the uh, the blackbird, which is one of the best examples of 
a bird that has moved from the forest into the city and has adapted evolutionarily, but also smaller animals, insects, uh, and many plants. What about the fact that it's so noisy in this city? I mean, can, can, for example, birds hear one another? They have to hear one another. They're not singing, you know, just for the fun of it. Actually, here in, in Leiden, uh, Hans Slabberkorn, a colleague of mine, is studying this this very thing, and he's recording bird songs in the city and outside of the city, and he always finds that birds in the city uh, sing at a higher pitch because that is better uh, audible over the din of the, the background noise of traffic. We, we're not sure yet whether that's real evolution, meaning we're not sure that it's really genetic. It could be a learning effect. That could be an adaptation as opposed to an evolutionary change. I mean, you know, if you if you, you move a dog to a new home, it'll adapt to that new home. But, you know, its genetics haven't changed, right? Yeah, that's right. So because these changes are so drastic and they happen so quickly, not all the changes that we see will be evolution. And Song of Birds is a good example. And also the fact that, that coyotes, for example, look both ways when they cross the street in Chicago. We're not sure whether there's a gene that makes them do that or whether they simply learn that if they don't do that, they get run over. But there are other things of which we are certain that they are genetic. For example, actually, I'm, I have a couple of students right now working on spiders here in Leiden, which uh, are adapting to making their webs very close to artificial lights because the ones that have an an innate tendency to do that will automatically get more food because insects are also attracted to light and they catch them in their webs. And when we get very young spiders and we raise them in the lab, uh, this is actually work that's done in Austria, not by us, but then you see that these uh, spiders, even though they are raised in a lab environment, still when they grow up, make their webs close to light. It seems to be something that they have adapted to do. And if you do the same thing with spiders from the countryside, they don't do that. So clearly this is something that's genetic. It's a behavior that has evolved in cities to make use of the fact that artificial light attracts insects. In the, in the case of blackbirds, there are so many things that are different in blackbirds that live in cities and the ones that live outside of cities that people are actually saying that these really are on the way of becoming two separate species, an urban blackbird species and a rural blackbird species. You know, uh, it's it's not so much that the animals are actually drawn to the cities. They don't see the billboards outside of town and say, you know, I think I'm going to live in the city. But they have no choice but to live there. Their natural habitats are shrinking very often, while urban areas are getting bigger all over the world. Uh, this sounds like a, a bad thing, and yet you write this is an exciting time to be a biologist studying this. Yeah, it's. I guess it's a sad thing that natural habitats are shrinking, and I think we should preserve and conserve as many, let's say, pre-human habitats as possible to preserve them for posterity. But at the same time, I also think that much of nature in the future is going to live in cities or in any case in areas that are strongly dominated by people. So the the biologist of the future will most probably be studying not animals and plants in these wild habitats, but animals and plants in human-dominated areas, in cities and and similar environments. So we will need to understand what's happening to these animals. And it's actually very exciting that we can see a whole new ecosystem evolving right under our noses. For a biologist, if you look a little bit closely, that's actually very exciting. I was interested to read that you characterize these city birds as having less nervous personalities. But that sort of goes against what we assume about cities. I mean, you said yourself that the pressure is on in the cities, and that's where humans develop neuroses, it seems to me. So how can these guys be somehow less nervous? Birds and mammals um, in the city, indeed, they are probably constantly stressed. In in nature, that's a good thing. I mean, it's a good thing to be stressed when there is uh, a sudden noise or a sudden thing that you get alarmed by. You can flee and you can escape from what might be a predator coming close. But in the city, uh, birds would constantly be alarmed by things that may not actually be dangerous to them. Noises, for example, uh, that that startle them but are not actually threatening to them. And at the same time, this constant stress level that birds would then have in the long run is not beneficial, causes health problems. So the, the ones that have an innate tendency to be nervous will probably not survive in the city. And the ones that are already 
have a genetic tendency to be less nervous are the ones that survive. So in the long run, that means that these city birds become less nervous. And this is all made possible by sex, right? I mean, isn't that the big advantage of sex? I mean, apart from being a good way to sell movies and automobiles, it, it allows a rapid evolution. I mean, isn't that one of its benefits? Yeah, that's true. Sex uh, sort of shuffles genes and it creates genetic variation. Um So you have all these different variants of genes that are floating around in populations of animals and plants and humans. Uh, And sex is constantly recombining and basically providing combinations that can be tested by natural selection. So I think in cities, the evolution we see going on there is, is thanks to sex and maybe also thanks to the fact that cities and and human activity keeps moving animals and plants around so you constantly have fresh blood coming into the population and with the fresh blood possibly versions of genes that might do particularly well in a city environment. You cite some other examples of uh, adaptations, Menno. Mice that have genes that give them a tolerance against heavy metals because of what they're digging up in the dirt in a city or lizards that have evolved feet for better grip on glass or concrete. I read one anecdotal comment from one of your readers who said that she's noticed that squirrels in the cities are more likely to smartly cross a street in a straight line rather than zigzag around, which uh, is what gets them flattened, of course, on the streets where I live. Yeah, well, that that it, it, that certainly might be true. Um, uh, like I mentioned earlier, these coyotes in Chicago, they... Apparently, they look both ways when they cross the street. And in fact, uh, this is also known from, I think, from chimpanzees in Africa, that they also look both ways when they cross a busy road. In uh, in Japan, you have crows, which actually use pedestrian traffic lights to put nuts on the zebra crossing when the when the lights are red and when the lights turn and the cars run over them and, and crack the nuts. And then when the lights are uh, turned again, they go back to feed on those nuts. So it seems that Clever animals like mammals and birds are actually using the same rules of traffic as we are. Menno Skilthausen, thanks so very much for speaking with us today. You're welcome. Thank you very much. Menno Skilthausen is an evolutionary biologist at the University of Leiden in the Netherlands. It might make you wonder what happens when these animal city slickers try to go back to the country. At least it prompts our imaginations to take flight. Hey, Frank. Didn't think I'd see your beak back here. Decided to rejoin the flock, huh? Nah, no way. I just flew back to settle finances. You know, pick up my nest egg. And unwind a little in the countryside, huh? Are you kidding? I've been a nervous wreck since I arrived. I got that raptor watching me like a hawk. I got some kind of hideous pollen stuck in my feathers. And this purple stuff is making my sinuses explode. Come on, it's lilac. Okay, the only time I should smell that is when it's piped from a boutique to a sidewalk. I sure could use a whiff of diesel to calm my nerves. Look, it's beautifully bucolic here. It's eerily pre-industrial. Oh man, I'd forgotten about that din. You mean dinner. Okay, Hank, first, those nocturnal noisemakers are not food. Listen, I can show you where to get apple cores, pizza crusts, and discarded packets of sriracha day or night. There's no fast food in the forest, but in the city, every dumpster is a diner. Yeah, yeah, but in the city, you have to dodge cars. I tell you, it keeps you fit. Look, I'm more spry than I ever was perched on a post all day. I can grab an entire soft pretzel from an unsuspecting tourist. Really? Sometimes from a suspecting one. Rural life makes you soft, Hank. Urban life is for the birds. I mean, literally, it's where the birds are. Move to the city. Farm living is the life for me. I get allergic smelling hay. The land spreading out so far. Also, I like my penthouse bird's eye view. All right, I'm grabbing my nest egg and I'm out of here. If you ever want to visit me in the city, Hank, I'll be living the good life on the power lines of 3rd Avenue. Okay, well, if I'm in town, I'll send you a tweet. Coming up, birds do it, bees do it, except when they don't. 
Find out how a population of African bees has evolved to reproduce asexually and whether biotechnology will one day give human females the option to do the same. It's Sex Post Facto on Big Picture Science. We're happy to introduce our new show sponsor, the Neurology Minute. The Neurology Minute delivers a one to two minute daily briefing on what you need to know in the field of neurology, the latest science focused on the brain, and timely topics explored by leading neurologists and neuroscientists. The Neurology Minute is from the American Academy of Neurology with contributions by experts from the Neurology Journals, Neurology Today, Continuum, and more. So, subscribe to the Neurology Minute wherever you get your podcasts, or visit aan.com slash podcasts for more information about the show. You know all about the birds and the bees, but here's what your parents might not have told you about bees. Some bees are odd birds. Most animals reproduce sexually. Their survival requires genes from both males and females. As we've heard, the resulting gene shuffling allows animals to quickly adapt to new urban environments, for example. But some species thrive by way of asexual reproduction. Ants, bees, wasps, fish, and even birds have spawned offspring with so-called virgin births. Now scientists have identified the genes that let female cape bees, an isolated population of honeybee in South Africa, reproduce without males. In most bee colonies, sexual reproduction between the queen bee and her devoted male drones is the norm. The female worker bees are infertile. But in times of stress, the female worker bees in this unique population of bees can reproduce. No males or queen is required. Evolutionary biologist Matthew Webster led the team that sequenced the Cape bees genome. We reached him at the Department of Medical Biotechnology and Microbiology at Uppsala University in Sweden. In this population of bees that's found in the very south of South Africa, normally they reproduce sexually. But when the queen of the colony dies or is missing, then the the worker bees will take over. And that's when they're able to reproduce asexually. The worker bees are able to lay eggs which will become new worker bees. But, But why can't they just make a new queen bee? I mean, what's gone wrong with that process? Normally, that's what they would do, but in these bees, the workers are a bit more selfish and they want to make eggs for themselves and produce new offspring from their own DNA. Another thing that they're able to do is that worker bees of this subspecies are able to invade the colonies of other honeybees. And what they do then is to lay eggs in other honeybees' colonies and then take over their colonies as well. And this is a behavior that's called social parasitism. Well, that's kind of interesting, but what does that have to do with the fact that they can reproduce asexually? How does that ability give them an advantage in, if you will, invading and taking over somebody else's nest? Well, that's because normally the the worker bees are all sterile, so they're not able to reproduce at all, so they don't normally lay eggs, and that when they lay eggs, they produce new worker bees. So it sounds to me that asexual reproduction not only avoids all the uh, social indelicacies of sex, but it actually gives them an advantage in being able to spread out. I mean, that might be a, a good strategy for a species. Yeah, so it is a good strategy for these cape bees. Um, They are able to spread out. The disadvantage of that kind of reproduction is that you don't resuffle your genes, so you don't generate new genetic variation, which is the uh, main advantage of sexual reproduction. And that's why sexual reproduction is so common among uh, the animal kingdom. So I would think that the whole species would suddenly develop so many defects that you, uh, you know, you'd, you'd go extinct. But these, these South African bees don't seem to have that problem. Well, when they reproduce asexually, then the colonies they produce will probably suffer from that problem. So they, they do also reproduce sexually at other times as well. 
explain to me how this actually works. I mean, normally you have an egg and a sperm and, you know, two different sets of DNA that come together and, and produce the DNA for a new organism. How do these worker bees manage to replace sperm with something else? Yeah, that's actually very interesting. So uh, normally when an egg is produced by a female, which could be a human or it could be a bee, what happens is that a cell divides into four different nuclei or four different cell nuclei, and only one of those will become the egg. Um, that's the way it works in humans as well as normally in bees. What happens in this case is two of those products will fuse together to produce an egg which uh, has the full set of DNA. So normally uh, an egg contains one of each pair of chromosomes, but in this case you get a fusion of two different nuclei which will become a, an egg with a pair of each chromosomes. So what you could say is that it's quite similar to them fertilizing themselves. But uh, they, they do this because the queen has died, right? I mean, that means that they're smart enough to know that. Yeah, either because the queen has died or because they invade another colony and they uh, lay their eggs in another colony. Now, Matt, your team there in Sweden has sequenced the genome of this bee and compared it with that of other sexually reproducing bees and found some striking differences in the genome. What, what did you find? Yeah, that's right. So uh, normally when we look all across the genome, there's very little difference between uh, these bees and the ones that live by and don't reproduce in this way. But we found a few different parts of the genome where there are really big differences and these, uh, these probably pinpoint the genes which are important in all of the different things that are different between these bees and normally reproducing bees. So what we can do is to look in these regions and try to understand what the genes there are doing and how they might affect these behaviors. I take it that that's still one of the big unresolved questions here is exactly why this behavior has developed. What big advantage does it offer other than the fact that, you know, you get somebody else's nest? Yeah, exactly. Um, we don't really know how it evolved, and we don't know why it's restricted to just this part of South Africa. You might expect that that behavior, because they invade other bees' hives, would probably spread further across the world, but it seems to have been stable for thousands of years, so uh, there doesn't seem to be a risk of that. Well, finally then, Matthew, if some species can reproduce asexually, and, uh, you know, that might not be good news in humans. It would be the demise, I suppose, of Match.com and other such sites. <laughs> but, but really, from a biological perspective, there are great advantages to sex, right? Yes, exactly. And uh, there are very large costs to sexual reproduction, which are related to the cost of having males, which, if you think about it, are quite useless because it's only the females that give birth. And an asexual reproducing species would be able to produce offspring and expand in numbers much faster than a sexually reproducing one. But it's clear that there must be very large advantages to reproducing sexually because we're able to shuffle up our genes, make new combinations, and generate more genetic variation. This is not a biological accident. This is an optimization. Exactly. Matthew Webster, thank you so very much for speaking with us. Thank you. Matthew Webster is an evolutionary biologist at Uppsala University in Sweden. Bees are one of the many animal groups that can reproduce without males. Could human females one day join that list? Well, I joked there at the end of the conversation with Matt about the effects on dating sites like Match.com, but actually, human asexual reproduction could be a possible outcome of the steady advance of reproductive biotechnology. However, the real drivers for that technology are otherwise. A world with fewer diseases, where hereditary diseases are totally eliminated, where people are healthier, everyone is pretty good looking, and baldness is inherited only in the sense that you might shave your head with a razor passed down by your father. Hank Greeley, a law professor and ethicist at Stanford University who specializes in the ethical, legal, and social implications of biomedical technologies, sees a number of trends in health, behavior, and appearance that will be the consequence of a radical behavioral change to come, summed up by the title of his book, The End of Sex. Okay, quickly, before we discuss what's going to end, let's find out from Dr. Greeley what people will continue to do. Humans will still have sex... 
I think they will enthusiastically and frequently, <laughs> just not very often to make babies. And sperm and egg will still be involved in some way? I think for almost all human reproduction, yes. But I do believe within 20 to 40 years, most people who have good health coverage all over the world will make their babies in a lab, in a clinic, rather than in bed or in the backseat of a car. And in that way, sex, for reproductive purposes, will end. Now, it might go without saying that this would be a huge departure from millions of years of creating offspring the old-fashioned way, with the occasional help from some come-hither looks, flowers, a cheap bottle of wine, except that this new technology will be a modification of a technique that's already 25 years old. It's called pre-implantation genetic diagnosis. Pre-implantation genetic diagnosis, or PGD, is a technique used today along with in vitro fertilization, or IVF. Sperm and egg are combined in a dish in the lab. A few cells are taken from a several-day-old embryo and given genetic tests. Based on those results, the parents can decide whether to turn that embryo into a baby. Dr. Greeley says the process will become easier and cheaper, and in the future, Easy PGD will make reproducing in a lab more popular than doing it under the covers. In the coming decades, couples will give up sex to reproduce in order to gain greater control over the genetic makeup of their child. So right now, there are really three or four different reasons people do PGD. One is to try to find out which embryo is carrying the genes, the genetic variations for a genetic disease that the parents want to avoid. You can also use it to look at the embryo's immune system, and people have done this to make so-called savior sibs who can provide bone marrow or cord blood for a sick, older sibling. Or the easiest thing to do is look to see whether there's a Y chromosome or not, whether it's going to be a boy or going to be a girl. So those are the main reasons people use PGD right now. The change that I see in easy PGD is instead of looking at one or a handful of genes, through whole genome sequencing, we'll get the entire genome of each of those embryos and be able to tell the parents anything that genetics can tell them. So instead of zeroing in on the genes for particular traits or more likely particular heritable diseases, you will be looking at the entire genome. And part of that is because our ability to sequence genomes is much faster. We can do it more quickly. And the cost has come down enormously. Yeah, it's really a remarkable story. In 2003, the first human genome cost somewhere around $500 million. Uh, recently, here in Mountain View, there was a company that was selling them for about $2,000 a genome. So the price has come down. It will continue to come down. And I'm pretty darn sure that price is going to get not zero, but a lot lower than $1,000 a genome. Well, as you said, the purpose of PGD will change in the future. So in, it will also include scanning for terrible diseases. But as you said, it will allow a couple to choose the character traits that they want for their child. It sounds like we'll be creating a personalized embryotic genome for your baby? Yeah, well, there's a subtle but important difference here between embryo selection, which is what I mainly talk about in the book, and designer babies or embryo editing. So it's not designer babies in that the two people involved can only get what they have to give. Their children can only have the genetic variations they carry. And it's trickier than that, too, because we got 23,000 genes. If you make 100 embryos, you're not going to get the full variety of the possibilities that two people could bring. So. It won't be the perfect embryo genetically, even if you could define such a thing. It won't even be the best embryo that those two people can make. But it might be the one they most prefer from the number they make, which for the purposes of the book, I say, in liking round numbers, 100 embryos. So you might get the one you like best out of those 100, but it might not be the one you like best in the universe. Well, coming back to easy PGD then, so a couple is in, in a laboratory, let's say, having one of the cells sequenced. And, and now, can you just take us through what the next step is going to be? How will they go about picking the attributes that they want for their child? And what are the different categories that will be offered to them? Sure. I think in some ways that's going to be the hardest part of the entire thing for a couple to figure out which embryo they want. And I see the information falling into five big categories. One is nasty, early-onset, bad genetic diseases. 
things like Tay-Sachs disease or trisomy 13. Happily, those are all relatively rare. But if you take 6,000 rare diseases, you get about a 1% to 2% chance of having a child with one of them. Those we can almost completely rule out by using easy PGD. And I think that's what parents will be most attracted to. So category two is other diseases, a higher than normal risk of breast cancer or Alzheimer's disease. A third category is cosmetics, hair color, eye color, skin color, likely height, nose shape, hair type, male pattern baldness, whether you're lucky enough like me to get hair that turned white early. All that we know that all these things have strong genetic associations. We don't know them yet, but as all this gets cheaper, we will find them. And so some parents might want to know about those cosmetic traits. So they might want to have a child who will keep their hair or their hair will not turn gray at the age of 40 or whatever it may be. Well, if they're smart, they'll want one whose hair turns white at the age of 40. But, <laughs> okay. But, in, the, you but know, the point is it could be that specific. Sure. And for some of these things, it may be, well, we can't tell you for sure, but we can tell you there's an 80% chance. For others, it will be certain. I don't think very many parents are going to do this in order to get a blonde kid or a kid with brown eyes. But if if other things are about equal, if the disease risks are about equal, I can imagine parents using it as a tiebreaker. Um, the fourth is more intriguing but less promising, and that's behavioral traits. I think parents will care often about those, math ability, sports ability, music ability, personality type. We know that these have genetic associations, but we also know they're really complicated. So we know all sorts of genes, which in certain variations give people very low intelligence. We don't know anything about higher than average intelligence. And even in 20 to 40 years, I think we won't know much. So I think it's an empirical question, but I think the best we're likely to do is say this embryo has a 60% chance of being in the top half or a 13% chance of being in the top 10%, which means it has an 87% chance of not being in the top 10%. Top half or top 10% of just human intelligence or? Intelligence, grad, music ability, sports class. ability. Um, you know, anybody who tells you this embryo is going to get a 1550 on its two-part SAT is lying. But for a whole bunch of behavioral traits, there are genetic associations. And then the last and the easiest one genetically is boy or girl. And some parents will care about that, and some parents won't. Does this make you uneasy? It is making me uneasy. The, the idea that we will sit down, or couples in the future will sit down and check off the boxes of the sort of child that they they want. So again, this isn't designing. It isn't picking your baby like but, put, figuring out what goes on your but burger. But you are picking your baby. Well, you're not checking off boxes. You're looking at a hundred embryos and saying which one you like best. That doesn't make you uneasy? Sure, it does. But it makes me a little less uneasy than being able to actually design them. You're taking something that is, is a random combination of two people's genetic variations and picking the one you like best out of it. It's still concerning, which is why the last third of the book is all about the issues we should worry about. Um, but on the other hand, it doesn't trouble me that deeply I'm a parent. My kids, happily, are 24 and 27 and healthy. And I did all sorts of things. My wife and I tried very hard to mold them when they were young. How is it different between what you do to an infant or a toddler to try to make them grow up to be a civilized human being versus choosing various genetic sequences? Is it different giving them a vaccination than choosing an embryo that is less likely to get a disease? I am not sure there's a, there's a very significant difference there. Next, we've only begun to address the questions this new technology raises. Our conversation with Hank Greeley continues as we outline some of the ethical considerations around this strange new world of human reproduction. It's sex post facto on Big Picture Science.
Hi, it's me again, reminding you that Big Picture Science is now on Patreon. So if you join now, you can become a dolphin. That's right. I mean, it makes perfect sense, particularly if you like fish. If you give $20 a month, you become a dolphin. And if what Seth and I are talking about isn't intuitive, well, find out what we're talking about at patreon.com slash bigpicturescience. But what if I want a little more fang for the buck, Molly? Can I become a, a velociraptor? Yes, you can, Seth. I didn't know that they had fangs. <laughs> well, most of them don't, but, you know, some have had dental work. Well, for $10 a month, you can be a velociraptor. $5 a month grants you the title of tardigrade. It's pretty simple, really. And how would you compare the benefits of being a velociraptor versus a tardigrade versus a dolphin? Well... <laughs> Well, the benefits, two of them are still around. But when it comes to Patreon, there are different rewards at different amounts. So if you become any of them, for example, you get bonus material, which is exclusive to Patreon supporters. But go to patreon.com slash bigpicturescience and find out what the other benefits are. Okay, but is there a minimum amount? Well, for $2 a month, you get the satisfaction of knowing that you keep the mics on at Big Picture Science and you get to participate in polls. Those supporters must be protozoa, elementary life, or, or maybe just the first life. That's right, protozoa. But whatever you can spare each month, it helps us out a lot, and we are grateful. So please head over to patreon.com slash bigpicturescience and sign up. It's easy, it's fun, and best of all, it keeps Big Picture Science going. So thank you. I, I've always wanted to be a velociraptor. Well, you can be, Seth, at $10 a month. <laughs> Just go to patreon.com slash bigpicturescience. Okay, it sounds like the way humans have been making babies ever since there were humans is in for a reshuffle. This may take some getting used to. Oh, Cliff, this wine is delicious, and the candlelight makes us both look at least ten years younger. Let's, uh, skip dessert. I was thinking the same, Marnie. Let's you and I go back to my place. Yes. Get cozy. Uh-huh. Crank the Pandora Theremin station. Um, and engage in some pre-implantation genetic diagnosis. Waiter! I'm, I'm sorry, what? You know, a little poetic romancing with genetic enhancing. Well, I was thinking more like... Uh-huh. Okay. What? And wrinkle this suit? Okay, this new approach to having babies might make family planning awkward at first. However, the frequent use of pre-implantation genetic diagnosis, or BGD, will raise more consequential issues. Grab the can opener for this can of worms. Earlier Stanford law professor and ethicist Hank Greeley explained the science of what he calls easy PGD. Now he discusses some of the difficult, even bizarre, ethical questions raised by bypassing sex and choosing our offspring in a lab based on genetic traits. Hank, half of your book, The End of Sex, is devoted to the ethical questions raised when PGD makes it desirable to have babies in a lab where parents can have more control over their child's genome. And you use a rhetorical device in the book by which you turn to the reader and present these ethical concerns to them. Why do you put the questions in the lap of the public? Because I think that's where they belong. I'm not going to make a decision about whether or not this is used the decision will be made on two levels, but it will be made by a large swath of humanity. One level is, do I want to do this? Do I want my family to do this? And if I do, what do I want to use it for? Do I want to use it just to avoid disease? Do I want to use it for these other issues? Those are deeply personal questions. Then the next step, the higher level is, what do I want my society to do about it? Do I want us to allow it? Do I want us to ban it? We will do better if we think about these things in advance. Well, we should look at some of the scenarios and some of the ethical questions, at least, that are raised in this. Oh, one of them, if we look at just plain biology and the function of sex, what the original function of sex was for any, any species, um, and the ways in which this will circumvent that, and that is to provide a new mixture of genetic material. So that's not an ethical question, although the question of directing human evolution is, but do we want babies where everyone is healthier and good-looking and you're leaning more towards homogeny rather than diversity? And I think that's a great question. I am here because 
my Irish ancestors relied on a monoculture of genetically non-diverse potatoes that got wiped out and led my starving ancestors to flee. Um, I think that is a good long-range issue. Will this reduce human diversity in ways that will be damaging? I'm not too worried about it yet because there are 7.4 billion of us with a lot of diversity. We're not all going to want the same, the exact same kids, and we're not all going to use easy PGD anytime soon. So I think the reduction is probably centuries off, particularly when you remember that for most of humanity's existence, there have only been a million of us or fewer. So we've got vastly more people with vastly more diversity. But to take it at a, at a specific example, it could be that we will make a mistake and we'll eliminate an allele, a genetic variation, because it's associated with something bad, but it turns out it also does something good. Sickle cell is maybe the best example of that, where if you get two and I'll call them bad copies of the gene, you get sickle cell anemia, and unless you're in a place with good medicine, you die young. If you get one copy, you don't get sickle cell anemia, but you also are much less likely to die from malaria. So there's a reason people with sickle cell anemia live in places that historically have had a lot of malaria. It's a positive trait there, even though it's also associated with a deadly disease there. Uh, I think paying attention to what genes we change and what the effects will be and monitoring to see if there are bad effects will be a really important step. Well, and I think of all the traits that make humans human and interesting, everything from different habits. Think of the people, the great the great artists that were marginalized maybe because I'm, I'm not... So, so I mean, I, I know where you're going, and I think yeah. it's, a, it's a great question and it's a really hard question. Sometimes suffering leads to really good things. And sometimes diversity at the edge of what's acceptable can lead to really good things. That's right. I knew you had the idea of flaws. I didn't put that well, but the idea that we iron out all human flaws, and yet we're very poor choosers. And, but you know, the first thing I'd come back to is with 7.3 billion of us and most of the flaws not being having a known genetic basis, it'll be a long time before we get that homogenous. But what I want to push you on is um, imagine that you're Vincent van Gogh's mother, and he is a brilliant, brilliant painter, absolutely fantastic, left things that 130 years later we are still marveling at, and he committed suicide at 30 because of mental illness. Would you rather have your son be a really, really famous painter and dead by suicide at 30, or would you rather have him happy? Suffering sometimes leads to great things. Sometimes it doesn't. The one thing we can be sure that suffering leads to is suffering. And so maybe in the long run, this would have some bad effects on our culture, but it would be very hard for me to say to any given parent, no, you've got to go ahead and have that kid who's going to have uh, bipolar disorder because otherwise the one in a thousand chance he'll be the next great artist will be lost. But isn't it a flawed premise to begin with that we will ever have the wisdom to pick the characteristics that make so-called better individuals? It feels like we're challenging the basics of what makes us human. So this is part, I think, of a lot of people's concern, a deep part of a lot of people's concern about this. And I'd only say two things. One is um, we're not going to eliminate all suffering with easy PGD. Most diseases don't have a strong genetic basis. Accidents don't have a strong genetic basis. Most of the mental illness, as far as we can tell, doesn't have a strong genetic basis. There will still be plenty of quirky, odd people, even if the parents do the best they can to produce a milk toast embryo. Um, but more fundamentally, I think this is one of the problems of choice. These things happen to our embryos and our children already, but it's a roll of a dice, and so no one's responsible. It's random. Are we morally better off rolling the dice and having it come up randomly than we are trying to take some control at the edges by making decisions? Let's look at some of the other thorny moral questions um, that you present. Uh, one, and it's implicit in everything we've been discussing so far, is that this is technology that is available, even if the cost comes down, this is available to families who can afford it. 
and that will probably only occur in developed countries, not developing countries. So what happens when part of the world makes babies in a lab and the rest of the world makes babies the old-fashioned way? That's a crucial question, I think, one of the many hard questions around equality in this. First, I think even in poor countries, there will be some people who use this, but most of the people of the Central African Republic or Laos or Paraguay are not going to use this anytime soon, and their kids will not be as healthy. Now, easy PGD will not give people super babies. We don't know how to make super babies, and I don't think we will for a long, long time. It's not going to give us X-Men or you know, super-powered mutants. I think it will give us kids who are 10 to 20 percent healthier. Rich kids and kids in rich countries are already 10 to 20 percent healthier than kids in poor countries. That's not to excuse an increase in that disparity. Any increase in that disparity is a bad thing. And I think we should have and feel a moral obligation to make this available to as many people as want to use it. But it certainly won't become available worldwide at the same time and to the same extent. And that's a problem. One of the reasons you say that this will become easy, and easy is the word that you use, is that the genetic sequencing cost will come down, but also there will be ways to get around in vitro fertilization. So right now, as you said, and you write, it's tricky, it's emotionally trying, it's physically risky, but there may be a way to make egg and sperm cells from stem cells. And that, I think, is the key to easy PGD. It's really easy acquisition of viable ripe eggs. But there's a technology called induced pluripotent stem cells. Most people have heard of human embryonic stem cells going back almost 20 years now with lots of controversy. In 2007, a Japanese scientist named Shinya Yamanaka figured out a way to take skin cells and turn them into these cells that look for all the world like their human embryonic stem cells, cells that can also become all the different cell types. And, you know, so people are really excited doing research to try to make them into brain cells and liver cells and heart muscle cells. But if they can become anything, they can become eggs and sperm. And they already have in mice, leading to the birth of mice with stem cell-derived eggs and stem cell-derived sperm. Well, this leads to a few questions about possible scenarios that seem just incredible to me, but we have to look at them. Um, One is... This means that there are fewer limits as to who could become the mother of a child. If you could take a skin cell off a 90-year-old woman, she could become a mother, but so could a nine-month baby girl. She could become a mother. Or so could a woman who's been dead for 10 years but who's had cells frozen and carefully preserved. Look how calmly you are saying that. You look like you have made peace with this future. This is... Well, I've been dealing with these issues for five years of writing (laughs) this book, Uh, but... I think those are things that will and should give people pause. But, you know, there are also some still weirder possibilities. So Lay lay a weirder one on me because it's already pretty weird. Okay. If I can make eggs from your cells and sperm from my cells, maybe I can make sperm from your cells and eggs from my cells. Who would want to do that? Well, I can think of several million gay and lesbian couples who might be very eager to do that. So there's a piece of political support for this kind of change that might not be obvious. There is, however, a a weirder possibility for that. Let's say we take skin cells from you and we make them into eggs, and then we take other skin cells from you and we make them into sperm, and we combine them, and we find a womb that's willing to take them. What have we just made? Have we made a mini you? Is it cloning? It's not cloning. It's not quite cloning. I call it uniparents and unibabies. And most of our genes come in pairs. We get one from our mom, one from our dad. Every place where you have the same version for both copies of the gene, this unibaby would be identical to you. But in some places, you get one version from your dad and a different version from your mom. Your unibaby would have a 50% chance of having one of each, like you, but a 25% chance of having both of the copies from your mom or both of the copies from your dad. And so that makes it closer than a sibling, but not quite a clone. This is one of the things that freaks me out. I don't know why anybody would want to do it, but 7.4 billion people, it's a big world, and there's some crazy folks out there.
one of the other considerations you raise is that of stolen cells. I mean, if we're talking about skin cells, that means that you could potentially, I don't know why I'm laughing, just nervousness, I guess, uh, go up to someone that you fancy and take a little, you know, scratch them, and then you have the skin cells under your fingernails, or celebrity, or you could find someone who was willing to trade in some of their skin cells, and so everybody could have a little bit of, I don't know, Angelina Jolie in their, in their baby. So at the risk of freaking you out even further, you don't even have to go that far. You were kind enough to give me a coffee mug with some water. I've been sipping that water. Every time I take a sip from that mug, I put cells of mine onto that coffee cup. But we're shedding cells all the time. We're shedding cells all the time. And so you don't even have to scratch anyone. You just pick up the Coke can or the coffee mug or something else they've used. So I think one of the laws that will clearly be needed is the law against making people unknowing and inadvertent parents because this technology in theory, makes that possible. You could today try to steal eggs and steal sperm, but it's a heck of a lot harder than stealing cells. Hank Greeley is a law professor at Stanford University and an ethicist who specializes in the ethical, legal, and social implications of new biomedical technologies. And a set of those technologies are outlined in his book, The End of Sex and the Future of Human Reproduction. Hank Greeley, thank you so much for speaking with us. It's been my pleasure. It was a great conversation. When I hear Hank Greeley talking about the implications here, I worry there's no stable equilibrium. I mean, you can say you don't want designer babies, but if I come back to you and say, hey, look, do you want your kid to be susceptible to all these diseases? You say no. So as soon as you fix them for that, it's going to be very tempting to fix them for something else. Well, what we've heard in the show is that sex has a purpose. At least it's the way that animals in urban areas are able to adapt and survive. So what happens if we get rid of sex altogether? Well, I don't think we're doing that, but it's been pointed out that asexual reproduction has a purpose too because it conserves the genome. It's the ultimate expression of the selfish gene because you don't have to mix your genes with anybody else's. But species that produce asexually, as we heard in the case of the honeybees, will produce sexually in other situations because otherwise they might die out. Yeah, 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 but they're trying to get the best of both worlds, I think. Well, who isn't? the Martians. Which which brings me to my final point here, <laughs> and that is there was a movie in 1967 called Mars Needs Women. And the plot of that film was that the Martians had done some genetic engineering on themselves. There were no more women. So they sent this message to Earth to import some women. Didn't work out for them. We want to thank the duo who help us produce this show, Gary Niederhoff and Barbara Vance. Thanks also to financial support from Rena Scholsky David and Sammy David, and to the William K. Bose Jr. Foundation. Big Picture Science is produced at the SETI Institute, a nonprofit education and research organization that investigates, among other things, the mechanisms of biology. I'm the Institute senior astronomer, Seth Shostak. Also, a big thanks to our listeners and our Patreon supporters. Your ears have been attuned to the episode Sex Post Facto. I'm Molly Bentley. And if you'd like to hear more Big Picture Science, well, you'll find lots of episodes in our archive at bigpicturescience.org. And if you're a podcast listener but prefer listening to over-the-air radio because your buds are awkward in the back seat, check out the listing on our website of radio stations that carry the program. And if your local station is not on that list, consider letting them know you like the show. And to reach us directly with your comments, well, throw in some faint praise, email it all to bigpicturescience at seti.org. Look, Marnie, I realize now I've made this whole having a baby thing way too complicated. Oh, I'm glad you're saying that, Cliff. You and I, we don't need this whole laboratory rigmarole. What was I thinking? I'm so relieved. All I need is your water glass. Are you done with this? 